California and then received a master's from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico in Mexico City. In 2010, he won the Alfonso Caso Medal. Uh, he's a co-founder of the Ur Urbanism and Architecture Collective, Zuburbia. And um, he's also taught at universities such as Woodbury University in San Diego and uh, Washington University in St. Louis. So with that, I turn it over to uh, Senor Osan. Okay, well, well thanks, uh, thanks, Brock, for the introduction. Thanks, uh, Rene, so much for the, uh, for the invitation. This is really an amazing uh, um, uh, seminar and amazing uh, lecture series. So uh, I'm really, uh, really, uh, really happy to be here. So um, I'm going to try to keep it as, um, I'm going to actually turn my camera off, uh, stop the video while I present. So um, I'm going to try to keep it as, as uh, brief as possible so we can, uh, we can uh, maybe move on to the, uh, to the questions, um, okay. I, I took the I, I took the uh, the the uh, the idea for the title. Um, so the whole presentation is kind of um, um, a response to this uh, these three uh, words that uh, Richard Rogers uses to describe Mexico City in in his uh, in his uh, Cities for a Small Planet um, uh, book. So um, kind of a I don't know these. I, I when I read it, they they kind of stuck with me, and I've kind of a. Uh, at one point, I, they, they they kind of um, his uh, oversimplification of, of Mexico City kind of uh, uh, pissed me off. But I but I guess uh, I guess there's there's a uh, there's a certain truth to uh, to this, but there's also uh, so much um, so much more to the city. So okay, so this is uh, this is Mexico City. This is kind of the, the this is uh, the uh, the slide with which I'm going to start and kind of close. Um, I'm going to kind of do a, a very quick overview of the city. I, I know uh, there's not much time there, and it's there's there's so many uh, layers to the city. Uh, um, probably some of you have been down here, maybe not, but um, uh, but anyway, so if if at cer certain points I, I mentioned some things that you already know or already, already um, 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 went through with, uh, with Rene, uh, I apologize. Um, okay, so first of all, kind of, I just wanted to give a, a, first, um, a first overview of where Mexico City is and within the uh, Mexican territory and also within the, uh, the, um, the urban landscape, the country's urban landscape. So Mexico City is right in the middle over here. Everything that you see in red is uh, are all the um, urban settlements within uh, Mexico. Uh, you can see a very uh, high concentration of, of urban settlements uh, here in this part, and we'll, we'll um, in the next slides see what that's about. So Mexico City is right in the middle. It's also part of a um, of a larger system of cities, and that's called the um, Zona megalopolitana, like the mega, mega, say in English, Rene, megalopolitana, anyway, mega urban uh, uh, system of cities that has Mexico City, you have Toluca, you have Querétaro, Pachuca, Puebla, Tlaxcala, Cuernavaca. So it's a system of, of, uh, of a series of major cities that are all interconnected, not, not physically necessarily, but, um, but um, truly in, in uh, certain um, uh, demographic, economic, and social, um, uh, through uh, economic, social, and, and demographic dynamics. So this is, this is what happens to, the, uh, to Mexico when we overlap um, uh, general uh, uh, topography. So there you can see that it's a very, uh, there's actually not, not many areas that can, that can that are uh, available for large scale urban settlements. So you have a uh, very, very um, um, highly, um, um, these, these areas with, with uh, sorry, sorry, sometimes I just kind of uh, think in Spanish and it's then okay. and, uh, go, into, go into English, but with the, these areas that are uh, with very um, um, steep uh, topographies and to the north, you have uh, you have these these large plains, but they're very uh, very they're desert areas. So actually, that leaves us with this with this area. Oh, and, and to the to the uh, southeast, uh, Yucatan Peninsula, you well, you have very very thick. Uh, you could eventually add the layer of um, of um, 
uh, vegetation and that would uh, that would clear finish clearing things up. So basically, you have this area here, which is the uh, it's called the Eje Neovolcanico or something like the uh, Neovolcanic uh, Axis axis, with, which is uh, where the most of the um, uh, Mexican major cities are. Everything from uh, Guadalajara to Mexico City and the cities that I mentioned and across over to um, Veracruz. So basically about three quarters of them of Mexico's urban population is concentrated along this corridor where Mexico City uh, is. Um, so that kind of gives us a uh, first overview of, of where Mexico City is within the urban landscape um, of the country. Um, I wanted to show this is this is one of my all time favorite images. Um, it's uh, it, this was done by uh, Alexander von uh, Humboldt, um, and it's it's thought to be the, the very first cross section of a of a continent. So the quality isn't isn't um, isn't top, but so it's basically going from Acapulco on this end, which would be this end over here, and crossing all the way to Veracruz on the other end, which is in the Gulf of Mexico. So going from the Pacific to the Gulf of Mexico and coming across uh, Mexico City, uh, the Mexico City Basin, which is up here. So I think this cross section really, um, really helps us understand so many of the problems that, have, uh, that uh, Mexico City faces and that we're gonna, we're gonna look at uh, further on. So Mexico City's at the very top of this closed basin, as, as you can see, it's, it's like a, a huge geographic bowl, uh, 7,350 feet above sea level, which is down here. So a lot of the problems that have to do with flooding, with uh, water supply, have to do with the geographic condition of, of uh, Mexico City. And we're going to see look at some more uh, details. But this is a very helpful map to a uh, cross section to kind of understand this, uh, this condition. OK. So as you know, well, in, in the middle of this basin up here, there's a, there's a, um, there was a, a, a lake, or more accurately, a, a system of five lakes. You have Zumpango at the very top, then Jaltocan, Texcoco, which is the major lake, Xochimilco, and uh, Chalco. This is an overlap. This, so this is a uh, satellite view of Mexico City, present-day Mexico City. And this is an overlap of the um, former system, system of, of lakes. During rainy seasons, they would eventually connect and kind of uh, create one single system, um, one single uh, lake. But during uh, dry seasons, you would see these as in, as five individual lakes. So that's that's another aspect that's key to understanding why Mexico City uh, faces all the uh, all the problems that the, that it faces um, currently. So that's kind of a um, so these are the like the like the two very very first. Um, um, things that we need to understand about Mexico City. Uh, it's it's a uh, geo, geomorphic uh, uh, structure. Um, there's there's uh, then there, there's a, I, I just wanted to point out that there are um, there's a bunch of myths around uh, Mexico City and its founding and its uh, history. Um, one of the main myths is that it's that it's a city uh, um, founded by the Aztecs in uh, 1325. Uh, that's that's an important moment in in Mexico City's history, but actually the uh, the entire basin has been inhabited for uh, over uh, almost thirteen thousand years. This is the um, this is uh, the Peñon woman. This is um, um, remains that they found in the area called uh, Peñon de los Baños near the uh, Mexico City airport, and it's uh, thought to be about thirteen thousand uh, years old. So for the past thirteen the, um, the whole basin has been inhabited on a nonstop basis. So, um, so really, the the uh, urban origins of the uh, of Mexico City can be traced uh, way before um, the actual founding of Tenochtitlan in 1325. Uh, nevertheless, um, the founding of Tenochtitlan is, is kind of one of the key key moments to understand uh, the history of, of of present day Mexico City. Um, this is a this is a, a depiction of, of the uh, of ancient uh, Tenochtitlan from uh, the, the great uh, muralist uh, Luis Covarrubias. So there's there's two moments uh, I say one one is one is two key moments. One is the uh, founding of Tenochtitlan in 1325, and the other 
is the fall of Tenochtitlan in 1521. This is a, an image from uh, Juan Gomez de Trasmonte. The image is from the uh, early 17th century. But it kind of, uh, what I like about these two images is that they clearly show um, two kinds, start to show two kinds of relationships uh, with, of the city with, the, with its context and with water. So um, from a very um, symbiotic uh, relationship that the, uh, that the Aztecs had with, with, uh, with, with water, uh, then you kind of um, we go into the uh, the um, the Spanish uh, city of of um, the capital of the of New Spain, and it clearly has a totally opposite relationship to uh, to water, and it kind of uh, opposes the natural uh, dynamics of the uh, of the basis uh, of the basin. So so it's uh, so it kind of uh, Spaniards come in. And it's kind of, uh, clear. Their war on on on, uh, on on soil, on water, on the uh, on the basin itself. So that's that's another key moment to understand where a lot of the problems of present day Mexico City uh, come from. So I kind of I, I kind of wanted to do this this very very quick um, uh, historic overview and point out these two uh, key moments that help us understand uh, the city. And then I'm gonna do a. a Take a huge leap uh, forward all the way until uh, the um, uh, mid 20th century, where I think uh, that that's where we have the next the next defining moment that really transformed Mexico City. Um, it's it's urban landscape, it's it's social dynamics, uh, and and of course it's it's uh, it's crises. Um, so this is a period. This is a very fascinating period in Mexico and Mexico City's uh, history and in, in the country's history. Basically, this period that goes from 1940 until 1970, it's the, called the uh, the Mexican miracle. So it's 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 this point where the, the Mexican economy was growing at a fantastic rate. It's the, this pro, this um, this period where you see Mexico's uh, great uh, modernization process and uh, urbanization process. It's actually that that during these these decades around 1960 that Mexico becomes a uh, predominantly uh, urban country. Before that, it was predominantly uh, rural. So it's a very it's a very fascinating period, and most of the things that we associate with uh, uh, with Mexico City happen during these. Uh, these uh, with with modern Mexico City happened during these uh, these three uh, decades. Uh, I always like to uh, put in any image from uh, Los Olvidados, the Young and the Dam, this uh, this amazing uh, Luis Buñuel film from uh, 1950 that really depicts this transition. Uh, you can really see um, see this this city that's kind of uh, in the process of of becoming a major city, a major modern city. And you really see it in the also in the um, in the different characters, uh, especially I would mention if, if, if you if you've seen it or if uh, I, I definitely take a look at this movie because it's it's really an amazing film. Um, you have two uh, two children uh, characters, uh, uh, Pedro, which is up here and the Lojitos, that's not in this image that are clearly uh, in urban and a rural uh, um Urban and rural characters, and they kind of uh, depict this whole this whole uh, transition. So, okay, so this is the period where where we 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 uh, see the um, the um, construct design and construction of, of all these uh, major masterpieces that that we, you've probably uh, looked at uh, over these um, uh, probably in the previous session uh, with Rene. Uh, this is the National University's uh, main campus in um, in in Mexico City. It's, it's several things. Uh, one is that, that I would like to mention. Um, one is this, this, uh, this, this sudden modernization of the, of the country. And the other, um, I think you'll notice is it's, it has to do with scale. Everything is, is, is really massive. All the projects are really massive. And it's, it's really a city that's kind of a, uh, learning to be a mega city, so it's it's uh, it's you see it's it's um, this massiveness, uh, this this uh, fascination with scale, that also has this political side to it, and this is the uh, 
the, uh, the, um, the great political moment of the uh, PRI um, uh, party. And, and you really see that um, um, translating onto the, uh, the, the physical um, uh, fabric of the city. So, so projects like uh, Ciudad Universitaria, National University, just to give you some numbers, uh, National Uni University does 50%, the half of all the scientific research that's done in the country, its entire population, just of the National University is about 300,000 uh, uh, people between students and, and teachers and so forth. So it's just, just, the, just the scale of some of the things that go on in Mexico City is, is, is sometimes uh, overwhelming. Uh, so then we have like, Torre Latinoamericana, which is the first uh, skyscraper built in, uh, in Latin America. We have Centro Urbano Presidente Alemán uh, by Mario Pani, which is the very first multifamily, uh, multi-unit uh, project uh, done in Latin America. So you have all these, these very firsts in terms of uh, in urban development and in, in architecture and so forth. Uh, another one, this is one of my favorites, it's uh, Unia Independencia, where actually uh, Rodrigo and myself, uh, my business partner, were uh, editing a book on this, on, this, uh, on this other project. And of course, it's also the, uh, uh, that period where, where we have a lot of these um, modernist uh, um, architectural masterpieces built in Mexico. Everything from, um, in case you didn't know, uh, Bacardi building by Mies van der Rohe. So we have a, a, a Mies building here in Mexico, uh, all the way to the more, the softer modernism of Barragan, which you probably all know. This is uh, Barragan, la, la San Cristobal, um, a photograph by his, um, his head photographer, which, which uh, was uh, Armando Salas Portugal. So, so this, is, this, is, this, is all, this all happens in that, uh, during that period, which is, uh, which is, of course, a very fascinating period. It's also a period uh, where, where you see these, these, it's not, you see this, this, uh, these processes uh, um, happening not only in, uh, in architecture, but also in terms of uh, infrastructure. I couldn't help myself. I, I really wanted to put this, uh, this image somewhere in the presentation. So this is, uh, this is uh, Total Recall, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Film uh, filmed in Mexico City and with these scenes in the Mexico City subway. So I wanted to talk about the Mexico City subway. So I decided to uh, to uh, pull this image uh, in. So it's also the period where Mexico City, when Mexico City um, builds its uh, its highway, it it hosts the uh, the Olympics. It's the first time in Mexico in '68. It's the first time that um, a Latin American country hosts the the Olympics. So it's really a um, uh, a period where there's there's so much happening and the city is is really changing at a at a at a at a very fast pace. And the other uh, another one that I wanted to highlight is the um, uh, the drainage profundo or the the the, um, the major sewage system uh, for the city, which was a uh, which was uh, a major major infrastructural um, uh, project from the uh, late '60s uh, early '70s. But at the same time. This is this is a period where Mexico City it's it's growing it's uh, it's growing at a at an amazing uh, at an amazing speed so so it's really the city's really trying to keep up with with uh, with its ever growing uh, population so it's a period where Mexico City I mean Mexico City has always been a city in crisis um, but during this period I think I think personally that it's where when Mexico City starts to really Really become aware of, aware of, it, of its of its major uh, crises and about uh, uh, and about its future and the future of uh, building a, a such a large city and in, in such a such a vulnerable uh, uh, setting. So um, that so this this is a period where where you start to really really um, uh, where local authorities start to really become concerned about, about the future and start to, uh, to, uh, to um, become aware of, of the, um, of the um, very dire um, uh, conditions that, that uh, may lay ahead. And uh, well, these situations eventually um, came along. So um, I'm gonna kind of do a, <laughs> run through a kind of a, checklist of some of these uh, some of these major 
um, crises that uh, that uh, Mexico City currently faces on a, on a daily basis. Uh, one is um, earthquakes. So we all we've all heard of the uh, 1985 earthquake uh, that killed um, over estimates say around uh, 10,000 people, uh, September 19th. Uh, in 2017, exactly on, a, on a, the same day, on a September uh, um, 19th, another earthquake hit, hit Mexico City and didn't kill um, 10,000 people. It killed the, about between 300 and 400 and it toppled a, a whole bunch of buildings. Um, so this is, this is really something that, uh, that's, that's part of the um, everyday life in Mexico City. So Mexico City, it's, so as I mentioned, it's sitting on a former lake. So you have this kind of a jelly-like, jello-like um, uh, subsoil that, when 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 uh, earthquake hits, it starts to wobble in a in a unique way. It's actually actually called the Mexico City effect. So the um, the effect that it has on 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 the built environment is truly uh, devastating. And everybody's kind of in Mexico City, kind of waiting for the for the next big one to come at at one point or another. Um, other one is flooding. If you remember that, uh, I might even go back to the very uh, to that cross section of uh, Humboldt. So, so you have Mexico City in, in here. So it's not a valley; it's a closed basin, which means that all the water that comes into the basin tends to stay in the basin, and it actually has to be pumped out uh, artificially. So, so, and and we're gonna come back to that in a, in a moment. This is, uh, you might remember this, René, uh, we visited that site uh, back in 20, 2010 yeah. with uh, your WashU students. And this is Valle de Chalco. This is this uh, Canal de la Compañía. It's a, it's a sewage, raw sewage, open, open raw sewage canal in the outskirts of Mexico City. Uh, it overflowed, and and you can see what happened to the uh, to the neighboring uh, communities that were all flooded with uh, sewage water. So this 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 happened because well, in Mexico City we don't have a um, um, a separation system where we where rainwater goes one way and sewage the other. So it all gets mixed up. So. There was a series of off-season uh, rains during uh, February of 2010, and that put extra pressure on, on these um, sewage systems. So there were floods all over the place. Actually, Chalco, which is this image, is like a sub-basin within the basin. So it's very, very susceptible to uh, flooding. And we see this every single year we have problems with flooding um, because all the, all the water the, since the city is sinking gradually, and this is something that we're going to look at uh, in the next slide, um, the, the distance that you have to pump water uh, to get it out of the basin is is becomes uh, larger every um, uh, every year. So it's it's really a, um, it's really a complicated infrastructural uh, challenge. Uh, the other, uh, which I just mentioned, is uh, subsidence. So um, Mexico City is on a on a former, uh, as we mentioned, on a former lake. It's as the city grows, um, demand uh, for water is, is, is obviously uh, much larger. So most, uh, about 70, 75% of the water that Mexico City has um, still consumes is um, pumped out of, the, um, out of the underground, out of the water table. So that, that means that uh, the city that was kind of formally floating on this on this uh, on this water table has has begun uh, has been sinking over the years. This is a very impressive um, um, image where we can we can see actually what what this uh, looks like. Okay, so I think I think I think it's quite visible. But this this um where you see these uh these pylons on the corners and you you see these these uh, steps that kind of have a, a bit of a darker color. That's where the street level was um, at the beginning of the 20th century. So the whole monument, uh, this monument, uh, El Angel de la Independencia, is built on a, on, a, on, a, um, on a series of piles that go way down into the ground. So, so the city has been sinking, but the monument has stayed in place in, in the original, at the original height uh, that it was built. So over the years, they've been having to add, add new steps to kind of compensate the, the, the difference between the original um, base of the monument and the, the new street level. So 
all you see um, in this section that clearly has a, a, a lighter color, those are all steps that have uh, been added over the years. So um, estimates say that the city has sunk um, on average about 10 meters over the, uh, over the years and it's, it tends to sink between five and 10 centimeters uh, uh, each year and some places up to uh, 30 centimeters, which is about a foot. So it's a major problem, and this this uh, takes it uh, a very a very um, um, a, a toll on 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 the built environment. So if you, if you've ever visited uh, downtown Mexico City, you can see build like just tilted buildings all over the place. It's really um, uh, a major uh, a major problem, and, and then you have all these other problems also related to. Uh, to uh, subsidence and just just to the uh, the, the the really complicated um, situation of, of Mexico's uh, underground. So this is a a giant sinkhole sinkhole that <laughs> appeared in, in downtown Mexico City a couple of years ago. Um, one of the uh, this this is probably this is probably for some experts this is probably the major um, problem that Mexico City faces uh, in the future, which is water supply. As you saw, oh, you, you, uh, we can't continue to, uh, to pump water from the underground. Uh, so water has to be pumped uh, into the basin from uh, neighboring um, um, rivers and, 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 uh, and lakes, especially the, uh, the Kutsamala. But that's a major infrastructural um, feat. So you got to pump it all the way up 7,000 feet above sea, le sea level. Then you consume it inside the basin, then pump it out. So it's it's really um, some say that that the the city just just can't hold on uh, any longer. So that's that's one of the big uh, and it's and it's one of the big um, uh, ironies of the Mexico City where you're flooding uh, every year and at the same time you're, you're you're um, you're struggling to quench the city's uh, thirst, so it's it's one of the um, um, major major ironies of, of present day Mexico City. And then you have some other additional additional conditions. Uh, we're surrounded by a by a by a kind of like a horseshoe um, uh, range of, of active volcanoes. So this is Popocatépetl. It's an active volcano. It's not close enough to uh, turn us into the next Pompeii, but it's 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 close enough to uh, become a major contributor to um, to pollution and air quality in Mexico City, which, by the way, is one of the other uh, major problems that we um, face. And here we come, we kind of jump jump into um, man-made um, conditions that that. Um, that translate into additional uh, crises. So pollution is a major problem. If you've ever been in Mexico City, um, everybody that's been in Mexico City um, probably have noticed that after being a week, uh, after uh, I don't know, after a couple of days or a week in Mexico City, you start to feel drowsy and your your eyes start to water and you start to feel kind of like. Uh, flu-like symptoms. Well, that's kind of a combination of the altitude and uh, pollution. So it's it's a very complicated situation, again, because we're surrounded by this, this, this uh, kind of a uh, ring of, uh, of mountains. Um, it's really all the um, pollution gets kind of trapped inside that, uh, inside the basin. So it's, go, if, we, if we would go back to, sorry, it's this cross section, which is really helpful. If we go back here, so pollution gets trapped in in this in in the in the basin, and the uh, the mountains make it very difficult to um, for the winds to come in and and uh, and get the pollution out of the uh, out of the basin. So there's been a bunch of projects, very uh, e that almost sci-fi utopian kind of projects, where uh, for example, Alberto Castillo, this famous engineer, he he wanted to drill these huge tunnels into the surrounding mountains and put they put in these huge fans to help uh, the pollution kind of a uh, the, the, the pollution that's trapped inside the basin uh, eventually uh, find its way uh, out so this is a this is another major problem it's not as bad as it was back in the 90s uh, things have um, um, have changed uh, in a positive way but it's still a, a major problem 
then you have a, a bunch of other social uh, problems uh, and, and crises. Uh, one one big one is inequality. This it's one of the most um, in unequal unequal uh, cities uh, in, in the world. These are images taken by um, a photographer called uh, Oscar Ruiz. They are you see in Mexico City and these are actual uh, actual photographs where we almost see the, um, uh, the impoverished, impoverished uh, population living in black and white and, and, and the, uh, the, upper, uh, the upper classes uh, in, in color. And you see the differences in, in also in density and if, if you go if you were to uh, to um, uh, come down at street level of course you would would see all additional conditions in terms of uh, access to uh, basic infrastructure and uh, um, um, uh, ownership uh, and of course access to uh, social security and uh, jobs and income inequality and so forth so but this is this is kind of kind of how, how that starts to translate onto the um, onto the urban fabric and it creates these very unique and very um, shocking uh, urban landscapes um, this is of course you have you you still have the uh, the although it's not city the city isn't growing at such a fast pace as it was back in the uh, 60 50s 60s and 70s it's still growing um uh, and it's and it's a very um sprawled uh that, that's where you kind of we kind of uh, go back to the to the uh, title of the presentation it's it it's a very it's a very flat city and that's that's one of the first things that uh, struck me when i came to mexico city was how flat and how uh sprawled it was so so this is this this is what Mexico City basically looks like in in uh, 70 75 80 um, percent. If you if you go to if you've been to Mexico City and you've um, if you drive out towards the uh, pyramids of the Tihuacan, you kind of come across uh, neighborhoods like this, which is the Catepec, a picture by a, a photographer called uh, Pablo Lopez Luz. So this is basically how the city is. Is, is is kind of uh, responding to its uh, ever-growing uh, population. So there's of course a housing crisis, um, a housing crisis that the um, obviously the government uh, developers haven't been able or haven't been uh, willing to to uh, tr truly uh, address. And this is kind of uh, how Mexico, uh, not only Mexico City but Mexico in general, has responded to the housing crisis from Tijuana all the way to Yucatan, you see these same cookie cutter um, um, neighborhoods um, built by uh, private developers. And of course, this this was this was um, this was how Mexican cities were growing back in the uh, 90s, 2000s. And uh, increasingly, you're starting to see these kind of uh, scenarios, people that are uh, um, abandoning these uh, these these uh, neighborhoods, these um, and moving back to the even if they get they, they put in a down payment and have been living there for ten uh, or fifteen years, they're increasingly moving back to cities because some of these um, some of these developments, housing projects, were like two two and a half three hours away from the central core of the city where all the jobs are. So, so a lot of people just just couldn't uh, cope with the with the whole situation. And you see a all over uh, Mexico, you see these these uh, half um, half abandoned uh, housing projects. So uh, in Mexico, these two pictures. This is a uh, Iztapaluca, a picture by uh, um, a photo by uh, Lidia Corona, and this is kind of I mean this is kind of one of the healthier ones. But you see so many so many that that kind of uh, go into these uh, these more derelict uh, conditions. Um, have of course, uh, of course, um, violence, and um, I'd be lying if I told you it's it's not a. I mean, it is. I mean, it's, it's, you have a city in a third world country with uh, 23, 25 million uh, people, so it, it does, it does have its um, its um, well, it's 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 layers of, of violence and uh, insecurity, but. Um, Actually, if you start looking at the entire um, landscape geography of violence in, in Mexico, um, you'd see uh, maybe Mexico City is actually one of the uh, safest uh, places or cities uh, to be. I want to show this that uh, this is 
image from the 70s, but it's from one of Mexico's great, great photographers, which is uh, Enrique Metinides. There's a great uh, documentary called the, um, the Man Who Saw Too Much. Uh, it's highly recommended. And uh, this is, this, this, I mean, Mexico City's violence goes, goes way, way back. I was, I was um, not, not too long ago, I, I read um, Graham, Graham Greene's um, Lawless Roads, which is a, a book he wrote after doing some travels through, through Mexico. Well, Green hated Mexico. He hated Mexico City. He hated the food. He hated everything. And there's one part where he, um, where he quotes uh, D.H. Lawrence and uh, says, I actually wrote it down here. It says, this city doesn't feel right. Feels like a criminal plotting his next rather mean crime. So that's kind of a, a sense that some people get in, in Mexico City and it's, it's, it's not new. And it is a major problem. I, I, I mean, there's uh, on average just reported crimes. There's uh, about 740 daily crimes against life and limbs. So there's, um, there is a prevailing uh, situation with, uh, with violence, which is another, another uh, layer that we can add. Of course, there's traffic. Uh, many people, uh, th this is one of the things that probably middle class and upper classes complain about the, uh, the most, which is uh, quite ironic be be because this is, some of the some of the figures are are, are quite um quite interesting. About only um, about ten percent of Mexico City's population uses uh, private cars, uh, so that means that around ninety percent, between eighty five and ninety percent of the population uses public transportation. But that small percentage of 10, 15 percent of the people that uh, do use uh, private cars uh, produce about seventy percent of the um, uh, Mexico City's uh, air pollution. So you have these these very ironic and uh, and um, relationships uh, that have to do with with traffic. And you see these major investments. This is again uh, another picture by uh, uh, Santiago Arau. And these are the uh, the elev elevated uh, beltways that have been being that have been um, they've been building since the two uh, thousands. So you see these massive investments in, in private, uh, for private um, uh, transportation, uh, which, which actually benefit only about 10 to 15% of, uh, of the population. Uh, and traffic is really bad. Um, IBM, IBM has this, uh, this survey this study they call the uh, commuter pain index. And back in, uh, I think the, the last time they did it was, was probably in 2000, 2012, something like that. And Mexico City was on the top of the list uh, of the uh, commuter pain index. So, so that meant that uh, it was a city where commuters suffered the most to get from one place uh, to another in terms of uh, uh, quality of transport, time, uh, um, cost, and, and, and a whole bunch of different, uh, uh, different things. And of course, we have a we have a, a bunch of um, uh, in addition uh, a bunch of um, political crises as well. Uh, this is uh, just kind of a so so you understand how how this how Mexico City works in terms um, in 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 terms of its its political structure. So okay, so what you see in black is basically the um, the uh, the urbanized uh, area. Uh, what you see the uh, the the orange outline uh, down here, that's Mexico City proper, like uh, the federal di what what was um, formerly called uh, Distrito Federal. So that's the uh, that's the um, kind of like DC, like Washington DC. So this is basically the um, what we what we now call Mexico City officially, even even though the uh, the metropolitan area is, is much larger uh, larger. Then what you see in gray are, are all the municipalities of the state of Mexico, which is the neighboring state um, that kind of uh, are part of the metropolitan area. And up here in uh, Magenta, that's one state, one municipality of Hidalgo, which is another uh, state uh, up north that is also part of the, um, of the uh, metropolitan area. So you have, and in addition, uh, Mexico City, the, uh, the uh, orange outline, is the seat of the federal government. So you have the federal government, you have uh, three state level governments, and then you have about 70, 70, percent, um, 70 to 75 
municipalities or or counties that that are uh, all all um, are all part of this uh, um, uh, urban settlement. So, if we were to do, um, for example, a political map of this of this uh, metropolitan area, you would see all these municipalities um, uh, painted, uh, colored in different colors. Uh, so some some are uh, in the left wing uh, Morena party. Some are on the uh, right wing um, PAN party. Some of them are are still in the uh, centrist um, um, PRI party. So it's a big political mess, and, and you have a lot of situations where you can see the uh, the black uh, urban continuum doesn't doesn't really um, respect these uh, these uh, political boundaries, but you have a lot of situations where you, you have certain problems that are kind of a uh, halfway between different uh, neighboring states or different or neighboring uh, municipalities. So decision making sometimes it's really complicated. Something, something that uh, a lot of um, uh, scholars and some uh, politicians have been trying to uh, to make happen is to have politician uh, development agency that 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 it's is not uh, um, really associated with any um, or um, connected to any uh, political party or any local government. So. Um, governments change every six years. So every six years, you have a new development plan, and and so forth. So it's it's really a plan. Um, it's a in terms of a, um, urban planning, it's a it's a huge huge challenge. So um, so actually, we came across that with uh, you probably remember uh, Rene when when we did the um, the uh, field research at Canal de la Compañía in Chalco, which we showed uh, um, a few slides back. That was an open water canal, so that that means that it's it's responsibility of the uh, federal agency called Conagua, which is the uh, National Water Commission. But the, it overflowed into the uh, the uh, state of Mexico, so that was uh, around in this area over here. So it overflowed into the state of Mexico, but it's but it's a canal that the sewage is basically from the federal district. So you had. You had these three different um, uh, political um, um, bodies, kind of uh, try to try to figure out whose fault the, the, the whole thing was. So, so just decision making in Mexico City is really, uh, really, really hard in that uh, in that sense. And I, I just wanted to um, uh, to point out another another major problem that I've been interested uh, recently has to do with. With the cities, I, I would call it uh, the city's kind of a um, hyper uh, centralization. We, you could really, you could really um, like tell the story of uh, period all the way, uh, all the way to the to the present day. So. Um, I've been, we've been doing some some research on on some uh, some some local dynamics that have to do with with these uh, this this hyper centralization. This is a this is a um, this is a, a a piece we wrote for uh, Pigeon Magazine over at Princeton a few years back, and it's kind of a, a day in the life of a uh, Julio Cesar Cucamara, which is this this uh, this guy, which is the uh, the last of the surviving. Uh, sewer divers in Mexico City. So as you saw, Mexico City is in this in this in this basin. You uh, you have to pump uh, raw sewer out of the basin to uh, to uh, to get it out. Um, and those pumps um, uh, get clogged on a on a regular basis. So the only way to unclog them uh, is to just basically dive into the city's sewer and and, uh, and unclog them by hand. So that's that's done by this guy. So, so there's there's a uh, you know, 20, 23 million people um, <laughs> uh, facing the risk of of of, uh, of being flooded by their own crap. And there's a single guy that, that kind of, uh, uh, from happening. So you can see how how vulnerable the whole city is in in terms of uh, of, of of its of its uh, of its survival. Uh, then you have Central de Abasto, for, uh, for example. This was, this is, um, um, this is the major wholesale market uh, built back in the 80s. 
This is another picture by uh, uh, Santiago Arau. Uh, it's, it's an amazing place in Mexico City. Uh, but for example, uh, a year ago, well, about in um, March, April, when the COVID crisis uh, hit really hard in Mexico City, um, one of the one of the um, hardest hit places was uh, this wholesale market, and sales dropped by about seventy five percent. And suddenly, every everybody was scrambling because it turns out that. 80%, 80, 80 percent of the food that that we uh, that we uh, consume in Mexico City is distributed through this uh, this central market. So again, you have these these examples of of uh, uh, um, a huge mega city that's really depending on these on these very very vulnerable um, lifelines. And just recently, this was uh, this was uh, about a month ago. There was this uh, major fire um, at the uh, uh, PCC, which is uh, Mexico City Subway's uh, central commands um, or um, yeah command center. Um, so there was this fire at this place, and it collapsed six of the of the city's twelve uh, subway lines. So the a, a subway system that moves around five million people every day. So I don't. Know, Maybe we could be speaking of about two to three million people that suddenly weren't um, uh, weren't able to get to their uh, to get, get get home or get to their uh, their jobs and so forth. So and this 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 has taken uh, just just this week they were um, they were uh, they managed to get the last lines uh, fully operating again. So so again, it's just these examples of how how it's uh, it's a city. And, and this this whole tradition of, of 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 centralization goes way 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 back, and you really can can trace it to the very origin, um, foundational myth of the uh, eagle and the serpent, and then Mexico and the name Mexico, which means the uh, navel of the uh, of the moon. And so it's this 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 whole idea of of centrality, of concentration, of scale. So, so that's another another major uh, crisis that uh, Mexico City faces uh, currently. And I just wanted to uh, wrap up with this uh, this uh, slide that uh, that I put at the very beginning. Uh, so, I guess in a certain way, we, we would have to agree with uh, Richard Rogers. It is a sprawling, filthy, and dangerous place, but it's also a fascinating city. I don't know. I, I think. I think I couldn't. I, I, I don't know. It, it, it may be a bit of a chauvinistic uh, um, um, comment, but uh, I think I, 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 at this point, I couldn't live in, in any uh, other city. And I wasn't born in Mexico City. I was actually not even born in Mexico. I was born in Argentina. Grew up in in Tijuana, Mexicali, up in Seattle. So I've been living in Mexico City for the past uh, fifteen years. But it's really. It's really the one place that I that I feel I can call uh, I can call home, and it's a very fascinating city. If you're ever uh, uh, down here, give me a buzz. I'll show you around. There's so many amazing places to. Uh, there's such an amazing. I didn't go too much into architecture, but there's amazing architecture. Uh, there's amazing food. It's it's really a, a fascinating uh, city. So um, I don't know. I try to keep it uh, as short as I could. Uh, Rene Brock. So it's kind of, I know it's a, it's, it's a lot to take in. It's a, it's a, but I think I just wanted to kind of do this uh, very um, broad um, overview of, of, of Mexico city and it's, uh, it's major problems. Great. Um, thank you, Felipe. That's um, yeah, it really helps and kind of parallels a lot of the sort of things that we saw on Tuesday as well. Uh, so it adds a little bit more to that discussion. Um, so, uh, Brock, do you want to begin our Q and A session? Yeah. Do I need to unmute? Uh, okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, first, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was fascinating on so many different levels. Um, as a complete aside, uh, when doing research for uh, uh, kind of your biography, I noticed that you have been doing a, um, 
it's an exhibition of sorts about Lance Wyman. Um, and what's funny is I actually have a official World Cup poster from Mexico in 1970 uh, that, use that uses that op art typography uh, that's kind of a holdover from the 1968 uh, Olympics. Um, so when I saw that you were doing stuff with, uh, about Lance Wyman, that name definitely registered with me. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just, uh, I'll narrow it down to one right now. Uh, what's interesting um, about Mexico City is that it, it seems like it's a city of a lot of contradictions, um, but mostly it seems like at this point, it feels like Mexico City is almost too big to fail, which is why things keep getting patched and stitched together. Because um, when you look at it, you know, you're talking about the pain of being a commuter, you know, the sewage infrastructure, things are settling. Um, and you almost think to yourself, why do people keep moving here if there are so many problems? Um, housing shortage. And so if you could elaborate a little bit more about why it's still, despite all these problems, still people are still trying to patch it and plug holes and people keep moving here instead of moving somewhere else. Let me just uh, turn my, uh, my video on, so I forgot. Um, no, great, uh, thanks, uh, no, uh, great question. Um, just just wanted to um, um, first uh, make a quick stop on the uh, the whole Lance Wyman thing. So uh, yeah, for those uh, maybe that uh, the name doesn't ring a bell, Lance Wyman, he's a graphic designer from uh, New York. He did the um, the graphics for the uh, Mexico sixty eight Olympics. He also worked on the actually Mexico seventy um, um, uh, World Cup. And he, he's done a bunch of work in Mexico City. Actually, he also did all the uh, wayfinding and the logo and the icons for the uh, Mexico City subway, which were uh, re, kind of re, redesigned. Uh, you can see them in the background for the, uh, for the film. And yeah, we did an exhibition on his work uh, a, a few years back. Uh, did a, did a, a book, uh, seeing if I could, uh, uh, somewhere up there. And, now it's been fun because we've been working, actually we were, we're currently working on a bunch of projects with, uh, with Lance in Mexico City. Uh, so, he's, so he's up there, he's in his, uh, almost in his mid eighties, but he's, he's still really active and um, they've been um, commissioning new projects for uh, public transportation in Mexico City, new icons for new, uh, new lines. And uh, it's, been, it's been quite fun. We actually were in the middle of finishing a couple of projects with him and doing some uh, some more projects. So, uh, yeah, eventually that would that would be uh, we can do a whole. Uh, if there's time further on, and you guys want to get together, we can do a whole presentation on on Lance's work. And I I, I bet he would love to jump in. Uh, he's a super cool guy. And and, regarding and, we can, and Felipe, we can also get into the controversy about Wyman and Pedro Ramirez Vasquez and who owns and who did the. Graphics, that's right. That's uh, a whole, I mean, which was a, was a whole nother can of worms, as we say here in the U.S. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's all. Uh, Pedro Ramirez Vasquez, PRV, was uh, an, an architect. Uh, um, he did some of the. I was I was actually I wanted to put him in the presentation, but uh, I thought it was going to get too long. So he did like the uh, Azteca Stadium, Basilica de Guadalupe, uh, the National Anthropology Museum. So these kind of on a cultural center. Exactly. So speaking of these these massive scale projects, uh, just Basilica de Guadalupe, I mean, you have like 10 million people coming into that building on a yearly basis. So it's it's really just just the scale. I think he's one of the guys that really um, better understood uh, the scale of Mexico City, where, where where it was going. And yeah, he was the, the head of the um, organizing committee of the uh, Olympic Games. So um, so there's kind of a like an authorship uh, um issue there with the uh, with the whole logo and and ah, that's uh, that's a uh, that's a never ending uh, dispute and in terms of um why why mexico city i again i think i think it has to do with with this just this idea of, of such a centralized uh, country i mean everything happens in mexico city i'm i mean i grew up in 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 Tijuana, mexicali and in Senna, like uh, in the, 
things are starting to change, but there's still in, in political terms and cultural terms, there's just so much concentration in Mexico City. And it's really hard to uh, to undo. Some Sometimes people's, people insist on why does the uh, minister uh, Secretaria de, like the Ministry of, of um, what do you say, Marina or Pesca, like the fisheries affairs and all these things. Why are they in Mexico City and not maybe in Veracruz or in Ensenada or somewhere else? It's, it's, it's this, this goes way, way back to the very origins of, of the city. And it's, it's, it's been this, this, um, this historic process of recentralization and over centralization, and it's really, uh, really so hard to um, to push away from. And um, yeah, the, the the city. You you mentioned something interesting, like it's uh, too uh, too big to fail. Um, there's Carlos Monsiváis, the great writer, has some nice some 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 really fun texts about. Uh, he calls Mexico City. Uh, he says there's on the one hand that there's there's kind of like a catastrophe chauvinism in Mexico City's population where people start to even feel proud of the fact that they they're survivors in this in this unsurvivable city and uh, he calls Mexico City a post-apocalyptic uh, city he says um, there's this kind of this feeling that the worst is already uh, behind us that we we somehow managed to uh, to overcome the the, the city's uh, many many problems and uh, and yeah that both the population and the city itself are, are uh, survivors and nothing can be worse than what, what, uh, what's already uh, happened to us. So there's kind of this, this, this funny pride that has to do with, um, with all these different uh, overlapping conditions in Mexico City. The, pop, the apocalypse happens every day. <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. <laughs> all right. So, I mean, we'll open it to questions to um, the rest of the students. So. Uh, you should be able to unmute your microphones. Ah, Alejandro Peinbert is, is here, René. Hola, Alejandro Peinbert. Yeah, I said hi. Cool. Alejandro is a uh, hello ch chair at the uh, at the School of Architecture in Mexicali. Good, good very close friend. Hello, todos. So yeah, I don't know if uh, if you wanna anybody has any. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, we still got uh, 15 minutes. Great. So shoot away, please. Any questions? Shoot away. Might have. I have another question if no one else is going to go. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, um, you're speaking about the uh, that period from 1940 to 1970, which is, you can, you coined the, uh, the Mexican miracle. Um, and I'm a huge sports fan and soccer fan. And so when I look at Estadio, Estadio Azteca, I feel like, it was built in 1966, and even at that time, it was such a massive stadium. It was like between 80,000 to 100,000, and so I kind of feel like that exemplifies that scale that you were talking about. Um, that is just a huge city, and it's in this period of growth, and it's just this massive structure, unlike has been seen at that time. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that mindset? Because you talked a little bit earlier when we were talking about the, the typography and the logos and everything about the architect, you kind of helped design that. Yeah, no, um, although I have to uh, point out that the, uh, the best team actually plays at the, at the university uh, over, uh, which is Pumas. Um, Pumas. <laughs> that's that's the team you gotta you gotta. Hey, as long as you don't, as long as you hate America, that's fine. Uh, there that's you go. That's fine. <laughs> we were on the same page there. Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah, so um, Azteca Stadium. Again, it's it's one of these uh, these um, um, works that we mentioned um, uh, from uh, Pedro Ramirez Vasquez or PRV. Um, yeah, and I think he was, I think he was a very um, controversial guy because he was, he amassed, he was kind of like, um, um, I would say like a, like a local Robert Moses. So a guy that, that um, amassed in, in, a, in, a, in an immense amount of uh, power. Uh, he never occupied like um, 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 uh, publicly, uh, he was never uh, publicly elected to any anybody. But he was, I mean, he was. 
he was head of uh, of the uh, uh, planning department uh, on, on a federal level. He was head of the uh, organizing committee for the 68 Olympics. He did all the major projects. And um, so he's, he was he was very influential. He was very controversial because he was a bit of a, a, um, a dictator in, in so many ways, kind of like like Robert Moses. And but I think he really he was he was probably the 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 one guy that really understood where Mexico City was going. So you think of Estadio Azteca, you think of the Basilica de Guadalupe, uh, and you think of uh, Anthropology Museum. Uh, they were designed for a city that was about uh, that had about eight million people, and now the city has about three times uh, uh, that population. And these are um, these are three buildings that that continue to work adequately at that at that uh, scale. So he really understood uh, the uh, where the city was uh, was going. Another thing that we have to understand about that period is that was it was kind of like the um, the uh, the high point of the PRI government, which was just 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 this robust, uh, huge, massive uh, uh, political party, and it was this uh, they call it a soft dictatorship, uh, but it was it was just uh, the the, uh, the 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 central government was so 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 big and so strong, and all these projects kind of uh, reflected that state of uh, that political state of mind of the of the PRI so PRI so. Um, so yeah, that I, I think uh, to to understand Mexico City and during that period, you really had to understand the uh, the role of, of PRI. One one that is uh, Diane Davis's uh, Urban Leviathan. That's that's um, that's a nice book to understand that period and and kind of um, uh, that side of uh, the, the 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 whole political side of Mexico City and its and its um, relationship with the PRI. Mm -hmm. Diana, professor at Harvard University. Yeah, she was formerly. Uh, so this is. Uh, it's you can find it easily in uh, in English. It's a great. So it's called the Urban Leviathan, Mexico City in the 20th Century. So that's a great book to uh, if if you're interested, Brock, in that in that uh, in that period. I mean, the young and the dead. There's so much uh, film and literature. Also, I I. I read uh, Carlos Fuentes or um, or um, um, Las Batallas en el Desierto, um, Jose Emilio Pacheco. So there's, there's it was a very, very um, productive period in, in cultural terms and architectural. So it's, yeah. I don't know if Rene, you would add, want to add something about that period from your perspective? I mean, no, like you said, it. Um, a lot of the architecture that was done was, uh, sort of uh, became kind of the uh, sort of part of the political image of the country. So therefore it was really modernism taking into kind of a, a very specific kind of uh, political identity um, like it did in many countries in Latin America. I mean, it's not just that Mexico did this, but you, know, you would see a kind of very strong kind of almost brutalist architecture uh, from that time, that would kind of represent all the works that the uh, that the federal government was doing, not only in Mexico City, but also as they ex kind of did other sort of projects uh, in other states, including what we saw in Tijuana during the 1970s and um, early 80s. So it was it was very interesting how you know all these uh, ideas of modernism kind of became part of a, a sort of the ethos of a of, of the politics of the politics of that time um, so um, there's a, there's a lot to study there and and there's also interesting I mean how did that become what it was is also very interesting back in the 1930s and um, you know in the 1920s where there was a kind of much more let's say um, original approach to modernism in Mexico City um, versus what happened later uh, with uh, some of the institutional versions of the of the movement, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting time. Uh, yeah. A lot of a lot of a lot of public work was created. Yeah, I deliberately kind of skipped those first decades, which were uh, really interesting, uh, like from the nine, nine, 1900 up into uh, the, the the 30s. 
that's where the you start to see the, the very first uh, expressions of, of modernism. You have Juan O'Gorman and, uh, and, and all these guys, uh, Villagran and so forth. But I kind of jumped into, because of, of time, into this period of 1940 to 1970, where, where you start to see the, these, this, this uh, massive kind of uh, um, um, introduction of, 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 uh, of modernism uh, into, uh, into these uh, large scale housing and uh, urban uh, development projects. Yeah, which Felipe so, yeah. was interesting, Nick, because this, this very strong movement, as you call it, I mean, we, we know that there are some works that were kind of done in other parts of the country, like with Tijuana Cultural Center and things like that. But really, uh, Mexican modernism skipped, skipped the periphery. It never, we never really got that movement, uh, you know, to be part of the kind of the impetus of, of, of growing and developing the cities in the north. Uh, you know, so we tended to kind of be more sort of an American city, kind of more suburban style cities, lower density cities, cities without many of these kind of uh, majestic and, and, and political modernists uh, buildings uh, that were done by all these great uh, Mexican architects. And, and what's, that's what's interesting that it's sort of, we missed that point. We, 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 we missed that, uh, uh, we, that train, you know? Um, and, 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 and so that's why you see um, there, there's there is kind of that uh, I, I wouldn't call it a reproach, uh, but there is this kind of antagonism between periphery and center, um, because of uh, sort of that, that goes back, of course, uh, to Felipe was saying, all the way of how the the country was sort of uh, how the country began, and even before that, how um, sort of the uh, colonialism, how it was a Mexico City part. Of, uh, a major influence in in sort of to this to the crown of Spain, uh, but while the peripheries of Mexico were really nothing, you know, they were they were just little churches and uh, uh, places that were just ranches and, and not really became anything until later in the 20th century. But on their own, kind of on their own, and or attached to uh, more to the U.S. Economy than to a kind of Mexican ideology. Any and any questions yeah. from students? We got uh, five minutes. Come on. And that's a good point. Uh, also, something I forgot to mention is that up until 1996, the uh, the head of the uh, Mexico City government was uh, was uh, selected directly by the president. So um, it's. Uh, Actually, democracy in Mexico City is quite is is quite recent. So uh, so there's there's a uh, it's been also a quite um, complicated uh, learning curve in that in, in in the political sense. So um, yeah. So so and this this whole relationship between periphery and center is is so is is, is still s so strong. And since Mexico City is the seat of the federal government, so there's so much still going on. Uh, but it's interesting. We should. We should discuss that uh, further on, Rene. That's an interesting uh, point there. I don't know if any other questions. David, Emma. I have a question about um, the smog. I know how the geography is kind of similar to Los Angeles, where it's in a valley and like um, cars obviously cause the smog. But are there any natural disasters in the geographic area of Mexico City that cause um, like fire, smoke, anything that worsens the smog in the valley? Uh, yeah, well, I, I wouldn't say that uh, on, on, a, on a regular basis. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually the image, uh, no, actually last year, the image I showed you of the, uh, of the smog, this was actually um, exactly a year ago because I was actually about to travel from, uh, I was leaving Mexico City and they published, somebody published this, uh, this image. And this this case, for example, um, it was worsened by um, some wild fi fires in the uh, in the uh, peripheries. So, but that was kind of a, um, an exceptional situation. It's not uh, it's not basically it all it all comes down to um, to uh, transportation. So it's not even it's not even related to uh, to industrial processes. Industry is basically has gone out of Mexico City. So that basically, it's, it's, 
it's that 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 that's um the origin of all this is in the uh that 10 15 percent of uh i mean of 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 the population that i i i include myself that uh that use uh private cars so um so yeah it's 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 pretty bad it, it gets it gets pretty bad and there's sometimes for example last year they they uh they uh, closed schools for about a week. Uh, they they ask people not to exercise outdoors, so it, it can get it can get uh, get really bad. One more question. One time, we got one more. Uh, question. I, I would just uh, add one. Yes. one but uh, what I do like about uh, pollution is truly democratic aspect in Mexico City because everybody from from Carlos Slim to uh, to uh, to your bus driver, we all we all um, breathe the breathe the same crap. So kind of uh, that's 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 the one equalizer that we still have in in Mexico City in terms of uh, democracy. And and you got one guy that is the plumber for everybody, right? There you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, one more, one more question. One more. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a question. Um, Renee, we talk, when we were talking about Tijuana, uh, you said that there was a period of time where they tried to like re, I guess, re-Mexicanize Tijuana, um, where they were bringing in like Aztec and Mayan statues. Was there, is there anything like that in Mexico City where they're trying to either re, like, re, like pre-colonialize themselves or are they trying to go in the other way to try to forget about like Tenochtitlan? Oh no! Well, well, that 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 entire period that that we were discussing with Rene, every, from the uh, early twentieth century century up until the uh, the sixties, the whole pre-Hispanic identity was that that was that was what what uh, what what um, the government kind of a uh, grasp uh, to to build their the, this new identity, this uh, new uh, post-revolutionary identity. So you see it all over the place. Actually, if if you if you were to look at all the uh, artistic production of that, um, you know, I would kind of want to, well, let me just pull out. <laughs> Sorry, the, uh, the, uh, that housing project that we're uh, researching uh, in, uh, in um, Unia Independencia. So it's full of murals and everything you see from that, uh, that area, you can really see the, uh, the whole nationalistic, Hispanic uh, influence, so you see it in the in, in murals, and you see it all, all over the place. And it was really, really the um, the, uh, the 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 cent the centerpiece of the uh, the the whole uh, the whole identity. So so definitely. Then 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 it, it kind of uh, faded out after the uh, after the seventies, and now there's there's a whole different approach to that to to how that history was was built, and kind of a very critical approach to. To how they kind of just exploited the the image of the um, of the uh, pre of the uh, pre Hispanic imagery, but um, at the same time they were really um, 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 marginalizing even more the uh, present day uh, indigenous communities. So now there's there's a there's a there's a whole uh, different uh, more critical approach to uh, to that part of uh, Mexican history, but. Yeah, if you if you come down and you see all the murals with all these pre-Hispanic influences, and it's 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 it was a big thing back in the uh, I'd say Rene right up until the seventies, then it started to fade out a bit. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, murals and I mean artists and kind of took that, to, you know, use use that as a kind of forming kind of a new identity. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, well. I think our time is up. Um, I want to thank uh, Felipe for this great uh, talk on Mexico City. I hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, took notes and it adds to what we did on Tuesday. Um, uh, please, uh, hey, if you have time, you should look up that, that film by Luis Buñuel. Uh, I think it's going to be worth your while uh, to, to look at that, um, especially, you know, any 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 work by Buñuel is, uh, is, is, uh, is amazing. So you should um, try to try to see that when, uh, whenever you can. Yeah, and it's uh, probably really easy to find and with uh, English subtitles, it's one of the major, major uh, 
films. And uh, see if you can find uh, Buñuel uh, had, uh, had to do two different endings, the, uh, the official one, and then the, the uh, producer said, oh, come on, Luis Buñuel, that's, that's too sad. Do uh, make another ending for the, uh, a happy yeah. ending for the film. So there's two, uh, there's actually two endings. Uh, see if you can find them both. Yeah, there's always kind of this this need to do a happy ending. Uh, they don't let us kind of be our, you know, our 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 own demise, right? I even put a happy ending on my. <laughs> picture, so. No, don't do it. You know, they, they can't take us the freedom of fucking ourselves. Um, um, oops, sorry about that. Anyway, uh, thanks, uh, Felipe, very much um, for for the talk, and uh, we'll be. Uh, you're invited to all our our, our talks next uh, next uh, week. We'll have a Lance Bernstein kind of talking about uh, about the city of Havana, but through a kind of lens of the cinematographer, of a filmmaker, uh, which would be very very interesting. Um, cool. Uh, no, yeah, I'll definitely be uh, be joining you guys. And uh, thanks once again, uh, Rene, for uh, for inviting. And uh, sorry for uh, some. It's still hard to. Um, I've uh, kind of a. Uh, uh, don't practice my English as much as I would I would like to. So sometimes I'm thinking in Spanish and trying to speak in English. So, but thanks a lot. And uh, I know there's so much everybody wants to do once this is over, which is a. Uh, but uh, any any anyway, uh, if you're um, if uh, you have plans to come down to Mexico City, uh, just ask uh, Rene for uh, for my contact and feel free to give me a buzz and if you need anything uh, else related to Mexico City I should have put my email in the presentation but um yeah uh, Rene has it and Rene uh, Brock has it yeah too. yeah feel free to share it with 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 the whole group all right and thanks for everybody else who's uh, from outside who came uh, you know Painberg thank you um and uh, anybody else who was who was here from the school all right guys I'll talk to you guys see you thanks then. everybody thank take you care Felipe. Ciao. Oh, thank you guys. Bye bye. Gracias, Felipe. No, a ti, René. Este, ahí, lo, ahí te escribo al ratillo. Órale, órale. ¿Te vas, ¿Tienes clase ahorita? Simón. Ah, ok. Saludos. Bueno. Sale, Ahí saludos. Thanks, un abrazo. Sí, gracias. Ahí lo sí. me das tu, René, lo me das tu, tu feedback. Ahí para sí, sí, claro, dónde, claro. Dónde, ahí dónde tengo que. Dónde, dónde tengo que <ríe> órale. Ya vale, cuídate. Saludos. Bye.